wait for just for a couple more minutes because there are a bunch of people coming in. Sure. Sorry for the delay. It's uh, very good of you to uh, allow such a late talk. In England, students are drinking by nine o'clock or whatever else students do. <laughs> I think we used to be the same before the corona. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So are the peop are people I'm seeing, are they from all over Turkey or just from Istanbul? Actually, this is an open class, so we also don't know where the students are coming from. Right. Mm -hmm. So anyone who is outside of Istanbul or want to talk about it can just um, talk about it. Yes. Right. Good. Many people. Is English taught universally in Turkish schools or in many Turkish schools? I don't really know, honestly. But in Bolshe University, we have a good preparation year where we learn English. And I mean, that's the case in Bolshe. And many private schools also give education in English. Mm -hmm. But I don't know for the state universities, I'm not sure about them. No. Probably the prestigious ones give a good education, but the rest of them might not be the same. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the state schools uh, in, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, give education in Turkish because mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's lots of university and uh, many of them just doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't, uh, <laughs> I, I know English is a very common language, but I can't, uh, pretend that we are much better. Nearly all Englishmen, including myself, do not speak a foreign language well. I speak a little French, a little Italian, no Turkish, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, uh, compared to people in Europe, Germans or especially Scandinavians, we're terrible at languages. I think we don't have to be perfect when we are speaking because the mm. language is based on communication. If yes. we communicate, that's yep. not... That's right. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Um, when I was 18, I hitchhiked from here to Italy. And um, I found in France I could get by with what we call schoolboy French, which is terrible. Um, and in Italy, I... I picked up the language and quite quite uh, quickly. It's a, of course, it's an easy language for Europeans, but it was a wonderful experience. But largely, communication was a matter of smiling <laughs> at the right places. Okay, it's four past nine, and I think we can start our uh, lecture. Mm -hmm. Actually, before we start, I would like to inform everyone that this lecture will be recorded and shared on social media. If you do not want to be seen, you can turn off your cameras. If you want to ask questions and don't want to share your names, you can send me the questions via chat and I can ask them for you. Um, I'd like to give a brief information about what's been happening in Boazici, uh, just a couple of information. On the night of 2nd of January, a new rector was appointed to Bosch University by the Prime Minister, which absolutely violates Bosch's <clears throat> culture of democracy. Peaceful protests have been going on ever since, and um, 11 of our friends are arrested. More than 300 people have been taken into custody, and 25 of our friends are in home detention, which means that they are in jail in their home. We're trying to protest um, 
these unlawful events in Boğaziçi University and also in Turkey, but we are faced with police harassment and police um, harassment. And just a second, she did. Violence. That's violence. 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 violence and harassment every day. Um, it is really important to us that the global academia knows the struggles we're going through because it is this kind of environment that we are trying to produce science and art and education. So thank you again, uh, Professor Blackburn, for joining us in this cause. And before I leave you the ground, I'd like to say that we do not accept, we do not give up, and we will not look down. So thank you, and you may have the ground. That's a very moving introduction, and thank you for it. Um, I'm, I feel honored to be part of your movement. Um, I think it is so important that academic institutions are free from direct political control, because political control inevitably is ideological control. Eventually, the government will suppress opinion which is contrary to its official ideologies or religions or whatever it might be and it will promote those which it thinks support them and this is completely foreign to the ethos that should govern universities the ethos that needs to govern universities is freedom of inquiry freedom of statement, freedom of discussion. There are limits, um, for example, incitement of violence should not be tolerated on campuses, I think. But within those limits, the free exchange of opinion is the lifeblood of universities. Uh, John Stuart Mill said this at the beginning of the 19th century, and his defense of freedoms is still the classic liberal position. And I'm afraid that is my position too. That's, I'm not a political ideologue in the sense that I um, march very often. I did march against us leaving the European Union, but that was another thing. Um, but I do believe that the autonomy, the freedom of self-government of universities is, is sacrosanct. So I am 100% with your um, cause and I sympathize with your difficulties. Now, I'm to talk about the philosophy of truth, right? Which is not 100% distant from what we've just mentioned. Um, <clears throat> but I'll start by talking a little bit about the way um, we philosophers in the West, uh, analytical philosophers who are sometimes called, have dealt with the problem of truth. The classic statement was uh, begun by Aristotle uh, to say of what is that it is true, that, uh, to say of what is that it is is true, and to say of what is not that it is is not true. Um, and that's fine so long as you um, have a distinction between uh, saying of what it is that it is and saying of what it is that it is not. Aristotle's formula became the kind of uh, flag, the emblem of what's called the correspondence theory of truth. The idea is that a true belief or a true proposition, a true assertion, I will not make big distinctions between those three, assertion, proposition, belief, they're all vehicles of truth. They're all things that might be true. And the, for my purposes, those are, it's not important to distinguish them for the moment at any rate. Something that might be true is going to be true if it corresponds with the facts. It's going to be false otherwise. And that's the classic correspondence view of truth. Um, and it's important to realize nobody really dissents from that. Nobody really challenges that. You will find philosophers who think they challenge it. Uh, Richard Rorty, a famous American philosopher, will say things which make it sound as though he dislikes it. And quite a lot of philosophers are on record as saying, 
they don't like a correspondence theory of truth. Well, the important word there is theory. They think that the correspondence that Aristotle has given rise to, it's perfectly fine in its own right. That is, it's a good thing to say. A true proposition corresponds to the facts. True belief corresponds with the facts. But it's not a theory. This is the counter argument. Um, and the issue why it's not a theory is often hard for people to understand. Um, the idea is that it's um, it's not getting under the uh, it's not getting into the engine. It's not getting under the bonnet. It's uh, do you have a bonnet? Uh, the bit you know the thing you lift if you want to look at the engine of a car. You have to get under the bonnet. You have to go into the workings. And the objection is that the correspondence theory doesn't get us into the workings. It doesn't enable us to understand things that we need to understand. Why not? <clears throat> well, the principal problem is that the notion of a fact is as slippery and difficult as the notion of a truth. Um, and the a way of seeing this is to think of people who at the beginning of the 20th century thought that there was a kind of science of facts. You could dissect facts, you could analyze them, you could break them open into constituent parts, rather like an analytic can, chemist can say of a white powder that it's a sodium nitrate. You find the bits that go together and that make up uh, a fact. This was the um, aim of one of the great classic books of the early 20th century, Ludwig Wittgenstein's Tractatus. It was a sort of atomistic view, a view that you could dissect into parts any complicated assertion find the bits that made it up, and those bits would be the bits that made up the fact. And Wittgenstein later realized this image was wrong. And the way he realized it, I think, is encapsulated. It's, uh, it's, it's well explained in a great remark he made. He said, if you look at an object in the world, even a complex object. So look at an object like, say, the Eiffel Tower in Paris. As an object, it can be moved around. You could move the Eiffel Tower to Berlin, in principle, if the Germans had had a, a, more, um, a, a more successful Second World War they might have wanted to move the Eiffel Tower to Berlin and they might have done it. But of course, they, they couldn't do it. Um, but you can't move the fact anywhere. You can't move facts at all. They don't have a spatio-temporal existence. You can't move the fact that the Eiffel Tower is in Paris to mm. Berlin. You can stop it being any longer true or a fact that the Eiffel Tower is in Paris. But the fact itself is not a kind of complex of elements, a structure, the kind of thing an analytic chemist can do, look at. The analytic chemist can take his sample of a substance from Paris to Berlin if he's a traveling chemist. But you can't take the fact that the Eiffel Tower is in Paris anywhere. You can stop it being a fact by blowing up the Eiffel Tower, or you can stop it being a fact by, um, by moving the Eiffel Tower, but what you're moving is a thing. You're not moving a fact. So Wittgenstein started to realize that the comparison between a fact and a complicated thing in the world was uh, misleading. It wasn't a good thing to say. So then the question arises, well, what other picture, what other conception of a fact do we have? 
And philosophers again and again ran up the thought that we can't separate the idea of a fact from the idea of a true proposition. The two seem to be intertwined. And of course, this is obvious in, certainly in English, I do, uh, in Turkish, I'm not sure who'd say it, but in English, it's a matter of style or choice whether I said it's true that Boris Johnson is prime minister, which unfortunately it is, um, or whether I said it's a fact that Boris Johnson is prime, prime minister, which is just as unfortunate. <laughs> It's, it's, as un, it's as unlucky as the first. Um, so the idea became that the, the locution of fact seemed to identify something else to which true propositions correspond. But then it seems as though it's really just a shadow. It's a way of talking about truth. Each um, vocabulary, each locution, the vocabulary of truth and the vocabulary of fact, as it were, live with each other. They're too closely intertwined for us to gain any philosophical insight by um, thinking about them to, as separate and as corresponding to each other. So that throws us back on how else to think about truth. And there are two um, more positions I'll mention before giving what I think is the answer. The two more positions is one was um, uh, in a sense of a, a, um, a descendant of the philosophy of Hegel and um, other German idealist philosophers in the 19th century. And they had a profound fact that, a profound thought, that it's wrong to look at the individual sentence. When we, when we think about truth, we think of the locution, it's true that, something or other. And what follows the that is an individual sentence. It's true that I'm sitting on a settee. It's true that we are on a Zoom call. It's true that um, Istanbul is to the east of London, and so on. The end of things, and they're all that's, and then it's, the that is followed by a sentence. And the philosophers following Hegel thought that this is in a way a, an unfortunate abstraction. It made it sound as though truths come in sentence-sized packages. One sentence, one truth. And they had the idea that, in fact, the fundamental element in truth is not a single sentence. It's a system. It's a whole, W-H-O-L-E, a whole um, bunch of stuff. So, for example, if you think about learning arithmetic, to take an elementary example, Sure, the child is tested on whether it knows that 2 plus 2 equals 4, uh, 7 plus 5 equals 12. These are individual sentences. And you can say, do you know that the answer to 7 plus 5? The child says, yes, 12, fine, that's good. Um, do you know the answer to 8 plus 17? Yes, uh, 8 plus 17 is uh, whatever it is, 26, no, 25 sorry, um, and so on. But you can't learn arithmetic in that way piecemeal. If you did, your learning would come to an end and there'd suddenly be some numbers big enough that you couldn't give the answer. Because um, after all, the child has only got acquaintance with a small number of these such sentences. It's only ever been taught two plus two plus four, uh, you know, six fives are 30, four eights are 32, and so on. Uh, but there's an infinite number of arithmetical propositions it's ever come across, and yet it knows them, or can answer them, it can do the sums. And so thinking of these kind of examples, 
this sort of Hegelian philosophers started saying any particular truth is a kind of abstraction from a big system. What comes first is the system, and after that the truths are, as it were, given their identity by being small parts of the system. It's very much like Aristotle uh, said about the body and its parts. A body, a human body, for example, you might think, oh, well, it's made up of hands and arms and bits and pieces, you know, heads and so on. But in fact, the hands and the arms and the head only have their identity. They're only what they are because they're parts of a whole human being, parts of a whole biological system. So in biology, there's a sense in which the parts come, the, the whole comes first, the whole animal, the whole organism, the whole organic unity comes first. And the parts are kind of abstractions from that. You can't make a human body by combining parts unless the parts are themselves thought of as having originally been connected to that body. So the idea became that truth needed a, a kind of a whole system for it to live in. It's rather, and this is a very common kind of move in the philosophy of science, if you think about it. Um, the physicist Stephen Hawking talked about the ideal of science being the theory of everything, theory which connect um, biology, chemistry, physics, subatomic physics, um, perhaps, uh, of course, relativism, relativity theory, quantum theory, and so on. The whole, the whole has to be understood before any part can be really said to be understood. So this holism, as it, we call it, has become a very dominant thought. Or again, if you think in biology, um, more and more people have become interested in the whole ecosystems. So, you know, you get problems like in Britain we have at present, um, what's wrong with our ash trees? There's a, a disease called ash tree dieback, which is very bad for ash trees, which are quite an important part of the English landscape and um, much loved element in the English landscape. And they're dying back and they're dying back and it's a problem. And scientists approaching the problem find they need to worry about the whole ecology that is the way insects work, the way fungi in the soil work, the way chemicals interact with the soil, the way everything, potentially everything interacts with everything else. Otherwise, they're not going to, they might have a recipe, a sort of, um, you know, solve it quickly solution, but they're not going to really understand what's going on unless they understand a whole, whole mass of stuff. Um, so this was a dominant thought at the end of the 19th century. Um, it had its roots in, I think, in Hegel, um, and it was quite common. But it was, it was kind of um, sidelined by um, the great pioneers of the analytic tradition, Russell, um, G. Moore, Wittgenstein, who were concentrating on the individual sentence, the individual sentence, the individual proposition. Um, so there's always a little battle within that, the, those camps between the analysts who thought about the individual sentence and what makes it up and what are its elements, and the holists who thought, no, what, we have to look at the system, we have to look at the whole of science. Um, uh, and eventually there became a kind of small victory for the holists because the analytical philosopher um, W.B. Quine, Willard Van Orman Quine, you may have heard of him, great American philosopher, uh, great American logician, 
He'd been to Vienna. He'd studied with the Vienna Circle for a year. He went back to the United States and he became converted to the cause of a holism. He said the unit of meaning is the whole of empirical science. And that was the unit of meaning. That's what you have to start from. So that gives you a different slant on truth. So that, uh, truth is no longer the correspondence between individual sentence and individual fact. That's just a truism. That doesn't tell us anything. Truth becomes the property of a whole system. Uh, and the first um, kind of... Uh, uh, implementation, the first kind of way of making that idea more concrete was called the coherence theory of truth, which is often supposed to have been that of um, philosophers before the birth of the analytic movement. There are things which suggest a coherence theory of truth in, uh, in Hegel and certainly in Bradley and some of the British idealists. You don't need to know about them. They're, they're not really now very much talked about. But the coherence theory of truth was a, an object of considerable worry um, at the beginning of the 20th century. And it re-emerged in the writings of people like Hilary Putnam and Donald Davidson in the late 20th century. And its, it's fundamental idea is that truth is coherence with a whole body of other things. So eventually, if you could get it all welded together, you know, the, as an ecologist might quite like to weld together the knowledge of all the bits that work in a biological system, if you could sort of achieve that, then you'd achieve truth. And nothing else than that was wholly true. It might be a guide to the truth, but truth would belong only to the whole system. And this was sometimes christened the absolute in the, um, in, in the vocabulary of the late 19th century. Following Hegel, people talked about this as the absolute, the, the last word, the, um, I don't know, the ultimate goal of inquiry, the absolute. And uh, it had all kinds of um, properties in the philosophy of the time. Eventually, though, that idea became, in turn, um, dismissed by many philosophers. They said, look, good, thank you for stressing coherence. There's no doubt that, you know, you can't learn arithmetic. You can't think of arithmetic as individual propositions, just sort of, happening together. Arithmetic is a system. That's absolutely right. We believe that. But the truth of anything can't consist simply in its place in a system, maybe as it were a coherent part of a system, but it might be false for all that. Because after all, there are novels there are fantasies, there are fictions, which form a system, but for all that, they're not true. They're novels and fantasies and systems. We're probably quite familiar with that, with that these days. You know, something like the, the world of Harry Potter forms a system, but it's a fiction. The world of Game of Thrones forms a system, but it's not... It's, it may be coherent, but it's certainly not true. And so we have to go back to uh, the drawing board to try and say something else about systems and their virtues. Even if we like the idea of systems, the concentration on systems, there, there's got to be a, a deeper contact with reality than mere coherence of a system gives us. So the coherence theory of truth was criticized on those grounds and is now, I think, no longer um, really very much admired. A, um, a well-known uh, in his day uh, Oxford philosopher, a man called John McDowell, 
had the wonderful phrase that the coherence theory of truth gives the, uh, the idea of a system spinning frictionlessly in the void. Uh, it was the system which, as it were, had no, um, no contact with anything except, except its internal relations itself. And so it's spinning without any friction in the void. And that's not good enough. We don't want our systems of belief to be like that. We want them to have their feet on the ground. Um, and that seems to have gone missing. So what next? Uh, well, the last substantial theory of truth I'm going to offer you is, was the idea of um, pragmatism. And pragmatism um, is often associated with three well-known Americans, Charles Sanders Peirce, uh, William James, brother of the novelist Henry James, um, uh, and a man called John Dewey, who is much less read than Peirce or James, partly because Dewey wrote too much. I think the, the catalog, the bibliography of his collected works itself is over 200 pages. Um, so you can imagine how much he wrote. So there are very few Dewey scholars. Um, but uh, the three of them together promoted the view that what was missing in all of these theories, both these theories, correspondence and coherence, was, in a sense, the Darwinian element. Now, what does Darwin bring to all this, you might ask? Well, the Darwinian question is going to be, why are we so interested? What's in it for us? Why do we have judgment, belief, propositions, the worry of the difference between truth and falsity? Um, what good does it do? And the answer, of course, is that part of the answer is going to be that it does you this good that if your um, project, your actions, the way you behave is based on true belief, you're going to do better in the long run than if it's based on false belief. That is, think of a primitive scenario. You, um, you want to go out and collect mushrooms or something for your food. Um, somebody comes and tells you uh, that there's a tiger hiding in the bush. Well, now, if what they say is true, then it's very important that you don't go out collecting mushrooms because the cost-benefit um, equation goes violently in the, on the side of cost. You're going to lose your life for the sake of a few mushrooms. On the other hand, if what they tell you is false, the cost-benefit goes the other way. You can saunter out and buy, get some mushrooms, which is what you want. So the costs, the benefits outweigh the costs. So the difference between truth and falsity, um, from a Darwinian point of view, has a lot to do with the difference between costs outweighing benefits and benefits outweighing costs. Uh, and if that's so, then creatures who pay attention to that difference, um, not like, say, QAnon in the United States, people who pay attention to that difference are likely in the long run to do better. You can um, gain short-term benefits by believing things that are false. You can't make a simple equation between utility and truth. Because after all, uh, a falsehood might be consoling. Um, suppose you're a, a loving parent, and in fact, one of your children has committed some dreadful crime, but you're on your deathbed. Um, somebody comes to you, they've got your welfare at heart, they conceal from you that your child has done this terrible crime. 
because they don't want to make things worse for you when you're dying out. And that might be justifiable. I don't, I don't take a stand on that, but it's certainly humanly understandable. And it means that they're giving you a consolation, but by telling you a falsehood. So in the short term or on particular occasions, utility and truth can come apart. But over the long run, you're going to do better if you base your actions on true beliefs. Truth is going to be conducive to success in action. And this gave rise to a, the idea that what the, what the notion of truth needs is a, a pragmatist element. It needs a connection to success in action. Um, and in various ways, C.S. Peirce, uh, William James, and in our century, in, in the 20th century, uh, Frank Ramsey, and then perhaps Wittgenstein, although Wittgenstein texts are very difficult to, to unpack, um, all wanted to try and inject this element of pragmatic success into the way we think about truth. And of course, um, again, if you step back a moment, you could think that it's got, this has got a lot going for it in everyday life. Why do you respect quantum theory? Because of iPhones, because of GPS, because these things enable you to do things which you couldn't do without quantum theory. Quantum theory dictates the design of these devices um, a, a major factor, I think, in many people's acceptance of Einstein's theory of relativity is that a GPS system, to be as accurate as it is, has to incorporate a relativistic um, uh, um, factor for the difference between the way space works and the way the surface of the Earth works. So there's a, a huge importance to science and to scientific knowledge in our day-to-day -day lives, in our practices. And that's grown and grown and grown over the centuries, obviously. Um, so, it, I mean, the first philosopher probably to stress the pragmatics advance, advantages of truth was, uh, I think, Francis Bacon, who was a, a an English philosopher working at the turn of the 16th and 17th centuries, he wrote in about 1620. Um, so the, um, the element which especially <clears throat> Britain prides itself on being a practical people, quite wrongly, but we do pride ourselves on it. Um, and this, the element that we like to bring in at that point was the, the idea of pragmatism. But I think it's fair to say nobody's ever turned the connection between success in practice and truth of doctrine into a simple equation, a simple way of thinking about truth. It's an important element in our attitude to truth, but it's not clear how to incorporate that into a, a definition or anything of the sort. And that brings me, have I got time still? Um, am I going on too long or have I got time? I think we have time, yes. Okay. It depends on so, you, uh, how yes. much we have. I just gonna... Fine. Um, this brings me to the final sort of view, which I in fact hold, which is that there is no problem of truth. <laughs> um, this is called deflationism. It's not it's not my own view, it's uh, quite a common view now. And it takes off from a, um, an observation which was made by uh, the great um, German philosopher Frege, mathematician, philosopher at the end of the 19th century, which is that if to call a proposition or a judgment or a, pro um, or a belief true, was to say something substantive about it, 
then you'd be faced with a regress because you get, first of all, let's take a judgment. There's a picture behind me, as you can all see. Okay, now let's say it's true that there's a picture behind me, sure. Now suppose that's a different judgment from there's a picture behind me. Then now we know that it's true that there's a picture behind me, but is it true that it's true that there's a picture behind me? That would be a different thing again. If, if it's true that was a substantial thing. So, um, so you get a regress. It's true that, it's true that, it's true that. But of course, basically, it's not, a, it's not an interesting regress. You're running on the spot. You started off with, there's a picture behind me. You're getting no further. It's true that there's a picture behind me. Yeah, sure. It's true that it's true that there's a picture behind me. Yes, it's a fact that it's true. It's really a fact that it's true. It's really true that it's a fact that it's true. You can go on forever, but you're not, you're running on the spot. You're not getting away from the judgment. There's a picture behind me. You haven't got a whole list of new, more important or different meta judgments, judgments about the original judgment. You've just got a way of saying the same thing. So Frege thought, well, perhaps it's wrong to try for a, substantive view of what truth consists in. Truth doesn't really consist in anything. Um, your problem, if you've got an epistemological problem, is, is there a picture behind Professor Blackburn? To which the answer, I suspect all of you would see the answer is yes. Um, that's it. That's the only thing to discuss. If somebody else says, yes, but I want to know whether it's really true, what else do you want to know? There's a picture behind him. I just told you. End of story. So relying on this very elementary observation, which is, I think, incontrovertible, Frege thought that the right way to deal with the assertion of truth was not by looking for a property of truth, be it coherence or success in action or correspondence with facts. Not all of those have their disadvantages. None of, the, none of them work totally well. Uh, and so let's turn our attention away from the very idea of truth. Uh, and turn it back to what it is to make a judgment. And this is a line followed by many modern philosophers. Um, I think the first uh, philosopher in Cambridge to take it up was a young genius called Frank Ramsey, who um, born in 1903, died in 1927, aged 26. He died just before his 27th birthday. So maybe some of you are getting that old. And in the course of his short life, he made um, advances which bear his name in mathematics, in economics, and in logic. Um, the Ramsey sentences, there's Ramsey decision theory, there's Ramsey savings theory in economics, there, there's uh, Ramsey theory also in economics. That's something different. Different. There's Ramsey theory in mathematics, and Ramsey sentences in the philosophy of science. So he was quite a guy, and uh, died before he was 27. Um, but Ramsey took up Frege's view and said, "Right, we don't want a theory of truth. At best, we want a theory of epistemology." or what Charles Sanders Peirce, the pragmatist I mentioned, had actually called a theory of the fixation of belief. And this turns into simply, in a sense, a morality of assertion, a morality of inquiry. When is, in, in, when is inquiry conducted properly? When is an assertion well-backed? 
what are the virtues of reason before you say anything? And I think that's exactly the way we need to go. Um, we need to be very careful, cautious, but also curious in the way we fix our beliefs. Once we fix our beliefs and have a belief, there's no further question about truth. If you believe something, you believe it to be true. That's the end of the story. That's deflationism, as they call it. Um, but there's a big issue about how you conduct yourself with respect to forming beliefs. And this, of course, is what's, I think, gone wrong in the modern world in two respects, and I'll finish by mentioning both of them. I think in some philosophers in the late 20th century, uh, philosophers like uh, Jacques Derrida, Michel Foucault in France, possibly some philosophers influenced by Heidegger in Germany, um, there became a sense that anything goes, that all opinions have equal value. And that's the way of saying there is no ethics governing how you form belief. As long as it's your belief, that's fine. That's my belief. End of story. I've got a right to my beliefs. You don't. You only have a right to beliefs that you've earned a right to. And to earn the right, you have to conduct or profit from careful inquiry, empirical investigation, long histories of separating truth and falsity, inquiry, in short. If you go posting stuff on the internet into which you haven't inquired, into which you have not verified your sources, into which you have no further knowledge than that Bob on my face group books said it or something, then you are trespassing against a duty, a duty. It's rather like the duty of not dropping litter in public. If you disseminate views for which you have no evidence, for which you have no backing, they may appeal to you. It's rather fun to think that, I don't know, um, one thing or another, or sometimes it's rather wicked to think it. But sometimes it's appealing to people to think what's wicked. But if you go around disseminating those views, then you are, in effect, littering the public space. And I think that's wicked. So that's the first thing. I think the idea that anything goes was um, a bad move on the part of some most, mostly continental intellectuals. And of course, they were, they were largely involved in things like literary criticism, where the costs of going wrong are very slight. If your taste is bad, I'm sorry for you, but you're not going to do very much damage. Whereas in science, for example, if your views are wrong, you might do a lot of damage. Um, Anti-vax movements, for example, do a lot of damage. A lot of people are dying because of them. Um, and yet they're retweeted and re, um, revisited in the public domain because people have no conscience about littering, about leaving litter in the public domain. And I think that's terrible. And I think that's a problem for us all. Um, and the other problem, I, th I think, when people think about the decline of truth or post-truth, they think of the decline in political morality. Um, I remember 40 years ago, when I was very young, um, a very juicy scandal in which the then defense minister, a man called John Profumo, was um, uh, outed by the press 
uh, for having sexual relations with a young lady who was also sleeping with a Russian attache in London, a diplomat based in London. And if there's one thing you don't want as a press secretary, uh, sorry, as a foreign secretary, as a defense secretary, somebody in charge of the nation's sort of military, especially at the time of the Cold War, uh, you don't want to be, uh, it to be apparent that you're sleeping with somebody who's also sleeping with the Russian, uh, Russian diplomat. Um, so as Profumo said in the House of Commons, it wasn't true. Um, but then it turned out it was true. And that was the end of his career. He had to resign. Uh, the government eventually fell because of it, but it, in the, it was a huge scandal. Um, the Profumo scandal. And that was, that was it. But nowadays, I think politicians wouldn't, wouldn't resign. They'd either pretend that the story was untrue or that it was, you know, um, mental, a mental problem they had and they were really victims of some kind of childhood trauma or some damn thing, and they wouldn't take responsibility. And I think that's a sort of post-truth world in which people feel they, they're not really to be held to account, they're not responsible for transgressions against the truth, for actual lying, misleading or spinning or falsifying uh, their accounts of things. And I think that's a decline in morality and I think it's a great shame. I think we, uh, we, we can't live up to perfection. We are imperfect human beings, but we can try for it. And I think a world in which people aren't trying for it is very bad and something to resist. And I think it's the duty of universities to resist it. So I'm sorry that you're in charge of, you're in the charge of a rector who may not feel that way. And I think you're right to fight it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I actually have a pile of questions that came from the students, but if we have any...